So what might life be like for a bee? Imagine yourself in a dark space, surrounded by 50,000 of your brothers and sisters. Despite the darkness, you see everything that's around you, using your sense of smell, touch, and through vibration. A constant assault of sensory information washes over you. And to an outsider, this might seem like chaos, but to you, everything makes sense. And you know your place in the scheme of things and carry out the task that you need to to ensure the survival of your sisters, your brothers, and your mother, whom you adore. This is life inside the colony, and this is the life of a honeybee. When you hear about bees, many of you may make an association, an obvious association, with bee stings. I'm sure the majority of us in this room have been stung by bees before. But to those of you that do make that association, I'd like to change your perceptions and your preconceptions about bees, and instead replace this with an idea of beauty, fragility, and an absolute necessity for our survival on this planet. In Australia, we have healthy bees, but we are one of the few places on Earth that can proudly say this. And internationally, bees are in decline, and this is a really big issue that I'd like to start a conversation about today. So humans and bees have a long-standing relationship for millennia. In fact, the first recorded documentation of humans interacting with bees is uh, a cave painting that's been dated to about 13,000 BC, and this shows an androgynous figure climbing down some vines to collect honey from a cave wall. And of course, we know that the Egyptians revered bees, and honey was thought to be a divine product that they used extensively in medicine, in religious ceremonies as well. And some of their agricultural success can even be attributed to the fact that they kept bees uh, for agricultural purposes. So it all starts with a single egg laid in the hive by the, by the queen. And remarkably, the queen has the ability to choose whether she fertilizes this egg or not as it passes through her reproductive tract. If she does fertilize it, it will become a female bee, and of course, a worker bee, um, which also has the potential to develop into a queen. If she doesn't fertilize the egg, it will develop into a male bee, or drone. And we can see from the three different bee types, or castes, they have very distinct morphology and body structure to carry out the various tasks that's needed of them. The worker is lithe and nimble to get into all the nooks and crannies of the hive and perform all those tasks that she needs to. The drone has excellent eyesight to find queens on mating flights and an enormous thorax to house its powerful flight muscles. And of course, the queen has an extraordinarily long abdomen to house her reproductive organs, which can enable her to lay her own body weight in eggs every day. And something that's really fascinated biologists for a very long time is if you take a fertilized egg that develops into a female larvae, that larvae can develop into a worker or a queen. And they're so vastly different. A worker will live for around six weeks, maybe producing about a twelfth of a teaspoon of honey in her short life. Whereas the queen can live for up to seven years. It's truly remarkable. Of course, the life of a bee starts with the egg which hatches into a larvae. And if for some reason the hive needs to generate a new queen because she's either died unexpectedly or simply isn't performing anymore and they need to supersede her, they will take a young larvae and feed it royal jelly, which I'm sure you've all heard of before. And they literally float these larvae in royal jelly. And they'll build a large wax cell around these queen-destined larvae. And typically, they'll raise more than one queen at a time to ensure a successful requeening of the colony. But of course, there can be only one queen per colony. So the first queen or virgin that hatches out will ruthlessly hunt down any other queen cells in the colony, chew a hole in the side of the wax cell, and sting any potential queens to ensure that her rule is absolute. And as you saw in that beautiful video earlier, she hatches out and then she will make her nuptial flight a few days later to mate and hopefully encounter one of these fine fellows. And this is a drone bee in mid-flight. Now, the life of a drone is somewhat tragic. 
From birth to death, he is absolutely, utterly, 100% dependent upon workers for feeding him, cleaning him, all of his needs. And really, he sits around in the hive doing just one thing, and that is thinking of a virgin to find a mate. But if he knew the reality of this, he might think differently. Because for the drone, to find a queen and mate is to commit sexual suicide. It's a bit tragic, I know. <laughs> and to make matters even worse, part of his phallus gets ripped off and left inside the queen. <laughs> but of course, he's played his part, he's passed on his genes, and the queen will mate with multiple males in a single nuptial flight and return to the colony. And she will take all of the sperm that she's taken on board and store this for her entire life. So she only mates once. So she needs to conserve this sperm usage, and she uses this throughout her life to repopulate the colony. So she returns to the colony, and so a new generation will begin. A new generation of workers and drones and potential queens. And of course, in the colony, there are many tasks that need to be fulfilled. Bees are much like us in some ways in our society. They have nurse bees that tend to young larvae. They have builders that build comb, air conditioners that fan the hive, and evaporate honey. Bees that will collect nectar from returning foragers and process this into honey. And of course, the bees that you'd be most familiar with, the forager. She travels from flower to flower, collecting much needed nutrients for the colony to ensure their survival. In the form of nectar, which is the primary carbohydrate source uh, for bees, and also in pollen, which provides them with much needed protein. But of course, this is no free lunch for the bee. She provides an invaluable service to plants because as she traverses from flower to flower, she transmits this pollen to enable successful fertilization of plants. And without pollinators, plants cannot reproduce, or many plants cannot reproduce. And this is why we have such a vast array of colors and perfumes and beautiful flowers in our world so that they can attract pollinators to do this critical task for them. Now, something you may have heard before, but I think is quite a startling statistic, is that one third of every mouthful of food you consume can be attributed to bee pollination. One third of every mouthful. That's remarkable. So this raises the spectre of what happens if we lose bees? How is this going to result in a looming food crisis? And how will this affect our ability to feed the world. I'm sure many of you would be aware that internationally, bees are in decline. And this is an enormous issue that is extremely prominent internationally, and yet I think in Australia is really only on the periphery of our collective consciousness at the moment. And I'd really like to start a conversation about how important this is today. So the causes of these bee declines are multifactorial and very complex. And I'd urge you, if you are interested in more information on this, Marla Spivak gave an excellent talk at TED Global this year and does a great job of uh, outlining some of the causes underlying this. But we can uh, classify some of these causes broadly as agricultural practices, so monoculture, growing a single crop type in a large area, and between flowering seasons, there's simply no food available for bees. They're in a food desert. Parasites and pathogens, just like us, bees can get sick, and they do have an immune system. However, just like us, some illnesses, some pathogens, some parasites can't be cleared effectively. And of course, chemicals, pesticide usage. Now, it's a modern reality that the agricultural practices we have today are necessary for us to feed the planet. We need pesticides. There are just far too many pest crops around. So we need to develop better pesticides that will target these pests, but leave pollinators unharmed. And one of the really nasty players that we know anecdotally 
can lead to large-scale bee declines in regions when it's acquired is this. This is the varroa mite. It's essentially a vampiric tick that will suck the blood or hemolymph of bees. That in and of itself weakens bees, but it really, the big problem is it acts as a vector to transmit illnesses in large doses throughout a colony. And so this can really impact upon bee health substantially. And Thankfully, Australia is still free of varroa. And this is data from 2010, but I can tell you since this data was released that uh, the South Island of New Zealand is now affected, Madagascar is affected, as well as other regions. And varroa, really through globalisation and the world becoming really a smaller place, has passed around the world very rapidly. So let's take a glimpse into the future without honeybees, what this might mean for us. So this is a pretty typical scene, workers coming in to the farm to do their daily work, and you might expect them to be ploughing or weeding, planting, pruning, but they're here for a completely different purpose. I think you'll agree that's pretty confronting. And there are regions in the world where this is a necessity. There can be no fruit. There can be no... There are certain crops that re require bees, and without them, this is what needs to be done. And these workers are using cotton buds or hen down dipped in pollen that's collected from flowers to hand pollinate these plants. Terrible future. But I am hopeful that this kind of future can be averted for us. And I think research is the key. And here at the University of Western Australia, I'm based at the Centre for Integrative Bee Research. And we're interested in understanding bee biology in a number of key areas, including immunity, reproduction, genetics. We work in close association with industry partners in the honey industry because they're the sentinels that can really alert us of any emerging pathogens or problems or uh, incidences of, of bee deaths that uh, can tell us that there's a problem arising. So, uh, and my research that I'm particularly interested in is in immunity of bees, and in particular, social immunity as well as genetic immunity. So what do I mean by social immunity? Well, if a bee gets sick in the colony, this can be recognised by other bees, either through them sensing the existence of that pathogen in the colony, or through secondary messengers, through pheromones or other factors that are released by a sick bee. So I'm interested in how do the adjacent bees in the colony or the other bees really monitor this, and how will they respond? They can increase hygienic behaviour. They can collect propolis or antimicrobial saps from certain plants, bring them back to the hive to try and eliminate these pests, or they can exclude affected individuals. And furthermore, if we look at healthy versus diseased bees, what are the changes at the genetic and epigenetic level that control their immune response? How is this hard-coded into their genome? And by understanding this, we can start to potentially breed healthier bees, understand disease processes to establish new treatments, or new strategies to control pests. So I think you'd agree that that video was pretty confronting, and there's a real emerging problem internationally which could soon affect Australia. But much like bees cooperate, I think the, the answer is in cooperative, collaborative, multinational research, and I am hopeful for the future. And so I think we need to drive research into this area of bee health and make this issue more prominent in the Australian psyche. So I would hope that today I've started a conversation about bee health and about their absolute necessity for our survival and our ability to feed the planet. And I hope that through increased public awareness, we can start to drive change and to find a solution to this problem. Thank you very much.